So the number is not embarrassingly small. Okay, 40. Here's what we saw so far. Vanilla recurrent, oh shoot, that should have said vanilla recurrent networks. But vanilla recurrent networks are poor at memorization. We saw this. The memory behavior is dependent primarily on, I'm full of spelling mistakes. Okay, so who is number 37? Okay, we said that recurrent neural networks, in, in conventional neural networks, uh, the uh, memory behavior was dependent on two factors. What were those? The weights and the, can you take your number from her? Yeah, so, so just stay at the back and just give them numbers, right? The weights and the activ activation function, not just the Jacobian. Hey there, everybody's being given a number, so take the number, right? <laughs> so, so uh, now, everybody remember that? When we said that the uh, behaviors depend on two factors, it was the weights and the, and the uh, activation. And there was also another problem, which was the uh, vanishing or exploding gradient problem. The gradient of the error at the output gets concentrated into a small number of parameters in the earlier layers and goes to, basically, you get a small number of terms for which the gradient becomes very large. For the rest, the gradient goes to zero, right? So this too is a consequence of the recurrent weights. And the, in this case, what was it a consequence of? The back, when, when we were speaking of gradients, what were the two things that influenced the vanishing or explosion of gradients? Who's number 41? One of you is 41. Who is 41? Okay, so what was, what was it a function of? So when we are speaking of back propagation and we said that the gradients tended to vanish or explode, what was it because of? We said there were two issues that influenced this. What were those? Who's 35? Yes, what were the two issues? Pardon me? The singular values of what? Pardon me? Which weight matrix? Is it the weight matrix from the input or the recurrent weight matrix? Which one? From the input? So, okay. <laughs> Who's number 26? I'm running out of numbers on the first question. Who's number 26? Okay, so what was that? Uh, the recurrent weights matrix, because that is what influenced memory, right? And there was a second term which influenced this. What was that? Okay, I'm gonna, if one question takes up so many numbers, we're gonna begin recycling. Who's 38? So what was the other factor? The Jacobian of the activations, right? That also tended to shrink the shrink or explode the gradients. So that kind of uh, that was the issue. So uh, we spoke of models where we would try to fix this problem. Who's 32? Yes. How did we fix the problem? Not sure. Not sure. Okay. You, all right. So let's try somebody else who is number one. How did we fix the problem? Pardon me? Gradient? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Can you speak up loudly, the mask? So, so it was only the gradient? No, so how did we fix this problem? Okay, maybe who's four? Who is number four? Okay, how did we fix it? We got rid of the weights and got rid of the activations because these were the culprits that exploded everything, right? Cause a lot of things. So the issue was the memory retention of the network depended on the behavior of the product of the Jacobian and the recurrence weight matrix. The recurrent, the Jacobian of the recurrent layer, right? And the recurrent weight matrix. And this also influenced the product of the uh, activation function, recurrent activation and the weights matrix influenced memory behavior. So these guys both tended to cause things to be forgotten and cause gradients to either explode or vanish. So we said, well, let's, can we have a network that just remembers arbitrarily long to be recalled on demand? And we came up with this model where we said that 
the memory component of the network is only going to have something that pulls in stuff from the input. And subsequently, the only way the memory is going to be modified is based on what is in the input. Locally, the memory will not be modified. So we had a structure which had no, no weights and no activation functions, correct? But then if I have no weights and no activation functions, what are the two things that can happen to what is in memory? Who's number 36? Who's number, who's number 36? Okay. What are the two things that can happen to what's in memory? Pardon me? We have already got rid of it. Something is in memory. So as I get new inputs, what can I do to what is in memory? So I think the question is not coming across. If you have, if you're remembering something, what can you do with what you're remembering? Forget. You can forget it, or you can augment it. Correct? Are these two the same operation? No. 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 So uh, who's 29? Okay. How did we deal with these two different operations in the network? We add gates. Pardon me? We add gates. We added, how many gates did we add? There are two distinct operations, correct? Mm -hmm. So is, is remembering the same as forgetting? Is augmenting the memory the same as forgetting? No. So how many gates did we add? Two. Two, right? We added one over here. So we'll get to that. But here is the overall structure that we quickly saw. We had the history that's carried through uncompressed. No weights, no nonlinearities. And we had it added gates that sort of modified what was in memory. We'll get into the details of that in a second. This is just a quick revision. The output itself, the memory is unmodified. We want to perform nonlinear transforms on the output, so we had extra processes going on that modified these in a nonlinear manner. So that's the actual nonlinear work done by other portions of the network. And of course, the gate depends on various factors, what's already in memory, what input you've got, what the current hidden state is, and other stuff. And so we combined all of these different factors in deciding how the gate would operate, and that was going to modify the memory, right? So going back to our model, this was the standard recurrent neural network. Does this have gates? No, OK. So uh, can, I, can I hear a loud no? no? Thank you, right, OK. And this was our long short-term memory network, as we saw. Here we have a bunch of multiplicative gates that decide if something is important or not. And again, remember that each of these lines is actually, every block that you see is actually representing a vector that's going into the page. Every connection that you're seeing, every arrow is representing a full connection from every uh, element to uh, the source to every element and the destination, right? And this guy here, was the remembered memory state, the cell state, which did not have any weights and did not have any activations. And the cell state had two components. Why did we need two components over here? Who's number 33? Yes, why did we have two separate things coming in, okay, modifying it? So how many different, or we just discussed something about the two different things you can do to what's in memory, right? What were those two things? Forgetting and augmenting. For, forgetting and augmenting. Why do we have two different things here? For two different operations. So what is the first one doing? One will forget and one will augment. If one will augment, right? So we had two distinct things coming in. One of them to help the net network forget if something is already is, is done and another to help it augment what's in memory if there's more of the same being discovered. And so, of course, we had each of these gates, and then the rest of the design of these operate things, the basic concept is simple. After that, exactly how you implement it is up to you, right? And this original LSTM had a forget gate, which considered the input, the previous hidden state, and more, as we'll see shortly. 
and the forget, forget gate modified the what was in memory. Then you had the input pattern detector, which had a, a, a uh, perceptron, but with a tan H activation, because you wanted things to be bipolar, you wanted decrement as well as increment, and an additional gate which decided whether it was worth remembering or not. This just ends up being a complicated activation. And then finally, the way it modified what was in the cell state was that first, you forgot things if necessary, and then you augmented things if necessary. So the output was the forget gate times CT minus one plus the output here, which is, this, this is the forget gate. This, is, this was called the input gate because it's modifying the input, the voice and memory. The input gate times the new pattern detected. And all of these are component-wise multiplications. So, and then finally, the output itself was put through a nonlinear transform because as we said earlier on, the raw memory is not what you really want to be working with, right? And so the output gets put through a, a tan H nonlinearity to be used by downstream processes. And this entire thing is operated on by a, for an output gate, which also controls whether what is going out is worth sending out or not. And so the output here, the final hidden state value was something that's derived from memory by putting it through a nonlinear activation and multiplying it by a gate. And last but not, le not the least, all of these gates also didn't to, uh, it, it doesn't make sense for them to just look at the input pattern and the hidden state because the hidden state value itself is being gated. So it makes sense to also look at the raw memory. And so they add a connection from the raw memory over here. And so this, uh, the forget gate looks at the input, the previous hidden state, and the, and the previous raw memory. So does the input gate. The output gate looks at the, the hidden state, the previous hidden state, the, the input and the updated value in memory because that's what it's designed, deemed to be, uh, deemed to be relevant over here. Now, this particular ugly structure looks pretty ugly. It's not irrational, but then there are other ways you could have implemented the same thing, yeah. Why is the, uh, the augment memory gate take the input from the original carousel and not from the carousel after the forget? Uh, you could do that. I mean, the point is, this is what is happening here. Strangest thing, okay. So the, this is just the, the first design that they came up with. There have been many, many variations of the basic scheme and theme, and we will, see one, we will see one more later in class. But you could come up with your own modifications and you can, uh, you can experiment with it. What you will find is that there's not a great lot of difference between how you implement these things. So long as you get the basic concept right, it works. So here is the, uh, there's some terminology over here, just to introduce terminology. This guy is the forget gate. It's the gate that decides whether something must be forgotten. I've got 27 open braces in memory. I've just seen a closed brace. That's what the sigmoid function does. And so uh, the sigmoid function is also keeping track of what it must be closing, which is why it has to look at what's already in memory. And so I'm going to go down from 27 to 26. So the sigmoid must output, it's basically a regression which, which gives you a value between zero and one to decrement the count a little bit. Then, yeah. Uh, just clarify again, why is it the first? The output gate? Uh, I have no idea, it's there, right? <laughs> so uh, the second one over here just says, okay, I have 27 open braces and I've encountered yet another open brace. Should I be incrementing the count? Or uh, now here's something, you can actually see that these are related. In a single operation, if I encounter a closed brace, will I also be encountering an open brace at the same time? No, right? So it kind of makes sense that when this guy forgets, this guy must decrement. But when this one increments, you don't need to refer to whether things are to be forgotten or not. So this, there's a relation between the two. It's not very clear. And this, so this is, the, this is the input gate, this is the input pattern detector, this is called the output gate, and this is the output nonlinearity. And the connection that comes back from the raw memory 
For the longest time, people didn't realize that this was important, then eventually they added it, they call it the peephole connection. So here is the complete set of operations that happens in, a, in this LSTM. This is where we stopped. So where is my sword? People can't see me on. Okay. So look at what's happening. As you go from left to right, what is the first thing you would need to compute? Who's 34? So what is the first thing you would need to compute if you wanted to compute the sequence of operations going for, for this, for this uh, unit? Well, if, if I understand right, um, in the first gate, So the very first computation that's happening over there has got to be the forget gate, right? as you can see from the figure. And the forget gate is taking in the previous raw memory, the previous hidden state, the current input. It's multiplying the concatenation of all three by a weight function, adding a bias. So it's an affine function of all three terms. And then it's applying a sigmoid activation because you want the output to be between zero and one. You're incrementing, decrementing things. Now the forget gate cannot necessarily, uh, I mean, you could, you could come up with your own tan h to say I'm actually going to be negating things, but Remembering negative things doesn't kind of make sense. So you have it between zero and one. What would be, so 39, who's 39? Okay, what would be the next operation? The input gate. And what would be the operation after that? 27? Who's 27? Okay, what would be the next operation? The data augmentation. So there are two operations that would happen in sequence over here, correct? First, you have the input gate, and again, the input gate is working on the raw memory, as you can see, the previous hidden input, the hidden state, the current input, so you have an affine function of all three, and you have a sigma that operates on it. But then although I've written these in this order, the next operation that happens is this guy, right? Which is, it's actually the next operation is to, the, is to detect patterns in the input. And so when you're detecting patterns in the input, you're computing an affine function of just the, wait, uh, there is no people connection over here, the raw memory and the input, and then you're applying a tan H activation to it. Now about the specifics of what each gate and what each detector is looking at, some of it is arcane. I do, I'm not really sure how they came up with these, but so you know, this is this is the initial design. Again, as I said, you can modify these basic concepts, and things will still work. Uh, so once you do that, what you've computed this guy, the input gate, and you've computed the pattern detector. What would the next operation be? Twenty-eight. Who's twenty-eight? Who is twenty-eight? What would the next operation be? Pardon me. But before that, is there any other operation? Um, you, have to the you have to combine these things, correct? So therefore, the next operation is going to be you multiply the raw memory by the forget gate and add to it the product of the input gate and the, and the pattern detector output itself. What would the next operation be, number eight? Yes. The next operation is first you would have to compute the output gate, right? You cannot multiply the output gate without computing it first. And the output gate is now an affine function of the current raw memory, the hidden state, and the input. And then once you compute the output gate, the operations of the output gate, the output, whatever this thing generates, multiplies the compressed value, tan h, of the raw memory, right? So this is the complete sequence of operations that you've got. The arrows should tell you the things that, are, that, that happen and in what order they happen. You're computing FT, IT, and C tilde first. C tilde and IT are, and, uh, and FT are all being used to compute CT. Then CT is being used to compute OT because the output gate depends on the current value of C. And subsequently, 
CT and OT are being used to multiply and to compute HT. So again, the details of this are not, I mean, this is just, this is the specific implementation of LSTM. You could come up with your own model, but you get the general concept over here, I assume, right? Yes, everyone? Um, when, when you're combining the inputs to the, the game, is this a concatenation? It's just a concatenation. It's like, you know, you're having three affine terms coming in. What's the last number? 57. Okay. Ten seconds, guys. Yeah. So, L S T M denumerates the weights and the and the activation. So, what are those W's for in this case? Pardon me. Okay. So, um, these masks are a bit of a problem. Can you can you speak louder, please? Yeah. So what are the W's for indication? So, so, you're, so the LSTM eliminates the weights and activations in the memory line, line only, right? In the, return. in the recurrent structure, there is no more memory. There's no, there are no more weights and there are no more activations. And to, and to control the line, you have various other signals which decide how things come in and how things go out. So LSTMs do have mechanisms for forgetting patterns. And this is a, a forget signal from the forget gate does not result necessarily in a decrement from the input pattern detector. Now this is a, uh, this is this, you could view this as a flaw, that if I'm forgetting a, 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 an open brace, I could potentially also be decrementing the count instead, right? So there's something, there's, there's something here where there has to be some interaction between the forgetting and the inputting that is not being considered over here. Those things are being treated separately, right? So just take a look at some pseudocode. I'm, I'm, uh, talk, we will be talk, little, discussing this code a bit today because uh, it, it helps explain things later, especially when you're beginning to look at backdrop. So the way we will describe this is in terms of a cell. An LSTM cell is a unit which computes this operation. Now, when you, when, you, when you implemented a recurrent neural network, a vanilla recurrent neural network, you could just think of this as a very deep network. At every point, you just computed an affine value and applied an activation to it and just, path, and just moved on, right? When you begin thinking of these more complex units, it begins to make sense to begin thinking in an object-oriented way when you, when you implement it. So here is a box, right? And as far as the box is concerned, this is what it's going to look like. How many inputs? Okay. Who's 57? Yes, how many inputs does the box have? Pardon me? Two? Three. So what are the three? Someone? Okay, so who's 48? So what are the three inputs? So it's going to be XT, and this is going to be HT minus one and CT minus one, right? And how many outputs will it generate? 49? Who's 49? Yes, how many outputs will it generate? So it's going to generate CT and HT, okay? I'm just going to draw this over here, CT and HT for, uh, for purposes of, uh, that'll become obvious in a, in a bit. Now, if I want to create a chain of these things, within one layer, at the next time, what is going to happen? I have 
this HT going here, this is at T plus 1, CT going here, which is at T plus 1, and then I have the next XT going in. This is how the connections are going to be, right? This is within, within one layer, right? Now suppose I have two such layers over here. What will the inputs of the next layer at the same time be? So who's 53? You there, can you take a number, 54? You're 59. Yeah, so we'll give them the number. So who's 53? So what will the inputs be for this guy here? Pardon me? It's going to be HT, so it's this going here, right? And, 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 the, and the corresponding elements from the same layer. I know the figure got a bit confusing, but that's what the connections are going to be, right? At every point. So observe what happened here. You had one input. This guy is going out to the next time. It's also going up. So the first thing you want to do is to write all of the equations for one of these boxes when you write out a code. So it kind of makes sense to think of this in, a, uh, in an object-oriented manner. First, when I think of any cell over here, we have the obvious five variables, the three variables going in, the two variables coming out. But internally, there are a bunch of other variables also, right? Every single gate, every single pattern detector first has the affine combination coming in. There are also the gate values. So how many different affine terms will you have over here? Anybody want to guess who's number 31? So how many different affine terms will you have? Uh, four. four. One for each of these four guys, correct? So one for the forget gate, one for the input gate, one for the pattern detector, one for the output gate. And then you're also going to have these intermediate values, namely FT, IT, whatever, whatever came out here, and the OT. So these are internal to the box. So I can just think of these as local variables for the cell because they stay within the cell. They don't go out. And now the cell itself receives these three inputs, C, H, and X, coming in from outside, H, C, and X, and produces C and H, right? And so if I, if I were just to write out the code for this particular cell, here's what it's going to look like. The very first term over here computes the affine value at the forget gate. So this is computing the affine value right here. And then the next operation is applying the sigmoid to it, and it's computing the value for the forget gate. Then the next, one, next operation, as we saw, you want to compute the input gate, so there's the affine value at the input gate, and then you apply a sigmoid to it. Then you have the pattern detector, you compute the affine value at the pattern detector, you put it through a tan H, you got a pattern. Then you update your memory, which is the forget gate times what's already in memory, plus the input gate times whatever pattern was detected. And then you compute the affine value for the output gate and apply a sigmoid to it to compute the output gate value itself. Compress whatever is in raw memory using tan H multiplied by the output gate. And so now we're going to be returning the raw memory and what's in the hidden state. So this, this, this piece of code making sense to everybody? Right. So. And once I do this, the actual recurrent code is very simple. Here's what I'm doing. I'm going through time. At each time, initially, I'm just going to call the very first input that comes in. I'm just going to call this a, layer 0, so H0 of t. And so at the lowest layer, I just have H, H, HT of 0 is the input, the 0th layer, right? Uh, I think I'm using the layer index as the second index over here. Then you can scroll up through the layers at each time. And as you scroll up through the layers, what are the inputs each layer gets? The cell in each layer is going to get the H value from the lower layer, 
Wait, it's going to get the h value from the lower layer. It's going to get the raw memory from the previous time in the same layer. It's going to get the hidden state at the previous time from the same layer and all the parameters of the cell itself. And now it's going to produce two values, which are C and H. And then the next time, once you've done computing this cell, you're going to go up to the next one. That gets as input these two guys and this one over here, plus, plus whatever variables, and then computes its own output and goes and, and uh, pushes them out. And then when you're done through all the layers, at the final output layer, you're just computing an affine term and applying a softmax to it to make your prediction. So this is simple enough, right? Nothing complex. Now, so the, although the, the uh, model begins looking very complicated, the moment I write it in this clean little object-oriented manner, the code becomes trivial to write. There's nothing fancy about it anymore. It just disappeared. All the comp complexity disappeared. Now, here's the real creepy business. Uh, which is, how do you train this thing? When I give you, gave you a simple recurrent, recurrent cell, there was just one affine combination, and then there was an activation. This thing looks poisonous, right? I mean, how on earth are you going to write all the backdrop rules for something of this kind? So if I actually begin to uh, look at the figure, let's just consider the derivative of the divergence, which will be somewhere out there, with respect to, say, CT, right? Let's begin looking at all the variables that CT influences and all the paths through which the derivatives might come back. So there's one path coming this way. I won't actually read out the equation because it turns out that it's not really important, okay? Then there's a path which goes this way, right? That also contributes to CT. Then there's a direct path because there are things being multiplied here and here. And then there is this path which goes out because of the gate. And there's something that happens this way. You can keep adding paths, right? If you try to figure out all the, all the ways in which CT influences the divergence, and if you want to trace every possible path, there's an extraordinarily large number of them. Same thing, if I were trying to look at the derivatives with say, of the divergence with respect to HT, there's a path coming from upstairs, you know, the line above. There's a path coming from the right, over here. There's this path coming through the input gate at the next time. There's, an in, there's a path coming through the pattern detector at the next time. There's a path coming through the output gate at the next time. There may be other paths that I have missed, right? I won't even bother to write out all of the things, ways in which the various weights are going to get multiplied, right? So if I actually asked you to write out all the derivative rules for something like this, I would be pretty stupid. And if you sat yourself down and decided to write all the derivative rules for something like this, you would be pretty stupid too. So this is where it really, really begins to make sense, to, to really, begins to make sense to think of how things are computed. The computational model of uh, even the most complex functions becomes much more useful when you think of things in, in computational terms. And as it turns out, all the months and years that you spent in school learning to compute derivatives may have been wasted once you think of things in terms of computation. If you know how to program things, you know how to compute derivatives. So let's take a look at the backward code over here. I'm first going to compute the backward computation, provide the backward computation within a single cell. So for the backward computation, we're going to assume that the static variables computed during the forward are still available, that you just sort of composed, uh, uh, you sort of allocated and uh, constructed the cell and all the variables in the cell and that you're retaining everything. And then I'm going to show you the, for the backward code, uh, we're just going to reverse the forward code. I'm going to show you the forward code for reference. Then we'll give you the backward code and indica indicate which of the forward equations each backward equation refers to. So 
the backward code for a single cell is simple, but it's long. And in my case, uh, over here, it extends over multiple slides, which gives me an excuse to invoke many of you for questions, right? <laughs> so let's start with this forward code. Now, go back to this box. This box is computing how many inputs and how many outputs is it, does it have, that box? Three inputs and two outputs, right? So who is 54? OK, if I were going backwards and I'm computing derivatives, how many derivatives would be going in and how many would be coming out? Pardon me? So things going back, you're going to have two derivatives going in here and three derivatives coming out. Right? Make sense? Yeah. How about H2 and H2? OK, so now you, you're going to answer a question out of turn. What is the derivative here? Pardon me? So what will the derivative be at the output of the cell? Sum of the, the sum of the two, right? I'm going to get a derivative coming this way and a derivative coming this way. They're going to be added out here. You answered a question, somebody else's question later in the slide already. So. Let's work our way backwards. So this is the forward code. And now clearly, because in the forward process, you're going from here and coming out here, right? So in the backward process, you'd start at this point and work your way to, a, to the front. So everything is going to be inverted, right? Now, so here's my backward computation. The reason I'm going through this in some painful detail is to make, point out to you that what looks painful is not scary, right? It's mechanical, but it's not scary. So here's what went in. You had the C and the H going out, so I have the derivative DS, DH and DC are just the derivatives of the divergence with respect to those terms. Those are going in. The, then you need all the variables that were used in the forward pass. We know this, right? These things are part of the backward. You're always computing the derivative at the current location, so those variables are required. So you'd be passing in C and H, which went out, and the, which went C and H here, X over here, and the output CO and HO. So all of these are also going to be passed in uh, in the backward pass. And what comes out are going to be these three terms, the derivatives for these three guys, and possibly the derivatives for parameters in the, in the, within the cell itself, because those things are required, right? And so the last operation, when we were computing the backward pass, was this guy. The very last operation was that we said the output, which was uh, uh, C O H O was given as, what is this? The output gate times tan h of c. Oh. This was the very last operation, remember? So now coming backwards, what are the derivatives that we will have when you're coming backwards? Someone want to tell me this? Of these various terms, who's number 50? Which, which derivative will you have? So coming back, you're going to have, which derivative will you have? Where are you going to start? You're going backwards. So which derivative will you be considering? This is the output is HO, correct? So this is the derivative that you're going to be computing backwards. I can think of this as some function that took O and CO and produced HO locally, right? So going backwards, it's going to take DHO and produce DO and DCO, correct? Going backwards. Every single operation is going to take in the derivative of the output and produce the derivatives for the inputs. This is always going to be the case no matter what the operation is. Is that making sense to everybody, right? So once I think of it along those lines, I have HO equals 
example, this is a component-wise product, tan H CO. I have given you DHO. What is, what are the two derivatives I'm going to compute next? Who is 51? So what is the first? Can you, can you tell me what are the two derivatives I'll be computing? So I've, this is the equation that we had, right? And you're given, obviously, you're obviously given the derivative of the output. And when you're coming back, because HO was the last thing computed and it went out, you're going to have DHO coming back. So given DHO, what are the derivatives you're going to compute? So okay, so who's, who's 52? Yeah, what are the two derivatives you're going to compute somewhere? D O and I'll just call this tan C O, okay? I'll just call it whatever T, okay? So this is going to be D T. And what is D O going to be? Samya. So D O People are getting confused. This has got to be easy. Who's 55? Who's 55? Okay, what is it going to be? So uh, this is the equation, right? So let me help you with this one. Obviously, if I'm looking at DO, that's simply going to be DHO times tan H, right? The derivative of this guy is simply going to be the derivative of this term times this one. Okay, what is the derivative of the tan h? I'm thinking of this entire thing as a variable. What is the derivative of that one? Can you tell me? Okay, who is 22? Who's 22? Someone is 22. You're hiding. Who's 22? Raise your hand, who's 22? Who is 22? Check, take a look at your numbers. This has been handed out. One of you is 22, who is it? This is the last number that I will call where nobody responds. The next time somebody doesn't respond, class is over. Okay, who's 43? Okay. It's gonna be DHO times this just O, correct? So that was very simple. Whoever was 22 was uh, scared, yes. So let's think about this again, right? What is the shape of DO if O is a column vector? This is going to be, what is the shape of the derivative of a column vector? A row vector, right? What is the shape of DHO? Also a row vector. What is the shape of tan? It's a column vector. Obviously, I've got to transpose it to make things fit. Make sense to everybody? Right? So that's basically what we did over here. I just come said D tan C, tan C O is DHO times O transpose, and D O is DHO times tan, tan transpose. There was nothing particularly complicated about it. And then, who's 23? Yes. I've got the derivative of tan, tan H of C O. So the next thing to compute is obviously going to be, what would the next thing be to compute? So no, but if this, is a, this is a function of some variable, right? So you're going to need to compute DCO, correct? And that's going to be just whatever the derivative of tan H is, which is, I think, tan H times 1 minus tan H squared. Is that right? 
square. Okay. I've done a plus equals to. Why is it a plus equals to? Pardon me? So here is why it happens. If you look at this, see, oh, for this, let's go back and look at the code, right? The, the, the figure. Once I compute the C over here, this C went out straight, but then the C also went out through this line, right? Through the tan H. So when I'm coming back in, I got a derivative past this line. The derivative through this line is going to get added up. Does that make sense? Right? So here's the, here's the key trick. If you initialize everything to zero, every single derivative, every single variable for which you're going to compute a derivative, or the, the derivative for every single variable that you're going to compute a derivative, after that, you must always just say plus equal to because in the, you never know how it's influencing the output. If you just assume that it's a local computation, you're going to make mistakes, right? If I'd perform the simple trick of just saying DCO is at time t is initialized to zero way early on, and then just written plus equal to in every one of these situations, instead of an equal to, everything would have worked out just fine. Making sense to everybody? Right, okay. So the next step before that was you had you had the output gate, which was O was the sigmoid of ZO, right? At this point, do we have DO? Who is 44? Do we have DO? Um, yes, because we've already, if it's been used later, the derivative has, has been obtained, right? So if you have DO, what is the next thing that you'd be computing the derivative of? DZO, right? That's going to be DZO. And what is that going to be? What is the derivative of DZO going to be? The sigmoid was d. Uh, so you had O equals sigmoid of of zero, but then here it's a function of a variable. You're going to need the. What is the rule you need? Pardon me. Can everybody just say loudly the chain rule? Chain say it loud. Chain right. So you're going to get d z o times the derivative of the sigmoid. The sigmoid, the derivative, of, you're trying to compute the derivative of the divergence with respect to the argument. So the derivative of the divergence with respect to the sigmoid times the derivative of the sigmoid with respect to its argument. Correct? And, the, and so the derivative of the sigmoid itself was O. So you ended up with d O. And then you're going to get the derivative of the sigmoid. Is that making sense to everybody? Why it's a chain rule? Right? You're going to do this for me once more. So that's what it is. You have DO times the derivative of the sigmoid, which is simply sigmoid times 1 minus sigmoid. Everything has been transposed to make sure that the sizes are just right. Okay? Then before we computed the sigmoid, what was the variable we computed? We computed the affine term that went into the sigmoid. Right? The affine term that went into the sigmoid was this guy, which was a weighted, uh, uh, the, the, the weights times the uh, raw memory, some other weight matrix times the hidden state, times some other weight matrix times the input plus a bias, right? So if I want to invert something of this kind, z equals zo equals some w1c plus w2, H plus W3X plus D plus B, what comes, what would the variable going in be? Oh. What would the variable, I'm trying to invert this process, who's 45? Who's 45, yes, what would the variable going in be? Huh? 
So what is the variable going in when I'm trying to compute the derivatives here? I'm inverting this, right? Yeah. So what, what, is, what, what will I need? I'll help you, right? I have zero equals something of a bunch of variables. When I'm going backwards, what goes in and what comes out? The derivative of input or? So this is going to be what would go in was the derivative of zo, and what would come out are the derivatives of all the arguments that went in. Make, right? We've said this many times. This should be burned into your head. It's nothing, there's nothing particularly complex about it unless, you do, unless you're not paying attention, right? So pay attention, right? Now you help me again. So I've given you dzo. Can you tell me the derivatives of all the variables over here? So what is the derivative of the divergence with respect to C? Uh -huh. It's got to be W1, is it? I'm asking of the derivative of the divergence with respect to C. What do I have at this point? I have the derivative of the divergence with respect to? Zo, right? So what is the derivative of the divergence with respect to C? Okay, somebody else want to help him? It's going to be D0 times W, right? W1. And just to be safe, I can always write a plus equal to if everything is initialized to zero, right? Now you help me again. What is the derivative of W1? It's got to come from the same formula, does it not? Right, what would it be? We've done this many times, right? If I've got any y equals wx, then the derivative, I'm always speaking of the derivative of the divergence, right, with respect to some term. The derivative of the divergence with respect to w equals x times dy. We've done this many, many, many times, correct? So now can you tell me what the derivative is going to be? So the derivative over here, I want the derivative of W1 out here, given the derivative of the divergence, derivative of the divergence with respect to W1, given the derivative of the divergence with respect to zero. What will it be? Guys, this is not working, right? These are like in the eighth week of classes. We've done this six weeks, for six weeks straight. What is the point? You're not here to just go and mechanically, blindly complete your homeworks. Because the next time somebody throws something at you, you won't know what you're doing. Somebody will have to give you a toolkit, right? Someone else want to help him over here? That's going to be C times DZO, right? Plus equals. Then, okay. I have four more terms over here. You're going to help me with this, and the rest I will rush through because we were running out of time. But the, but the responses need to be better than this. Who's number seven? Yeah. OK, so I have this equation over here. We've computed the derivatives for both these variables. What would the remaining vari derivatives be? Uh, is, uh, D8. D8, what is DH going to be? Uh, it's going to be D0 times. W2, and what is the next one? The derivative of W2 is going to be C times H times DCO. So you get the idea. I don't think I really need to go through this, but maybe who's number six? Okay. Are there any more terms you'd have to answer? Compute the derivatives. We've done this. What is the next one? I'm just going to say DX. Right, plus equals, let's help you over here. 
So it's going to be d0, d, uh, d z0 times w3, and then dw3 equals x times d0, right? It's very simple. So I can just, just keep going my way, way backwards from here. And at each point, I compute the derivatives of all the variables. I'm just working my way backwards, nothing particularly complicated. So if you see this, I'm so out of time. The next thing I do is I've, I've, I've got the derivatives for all the terms in the affine term. Then I get the, pre the, the line immediately prior to that was c equals 1 times a, you know, uh, f times c plus i times ci, right? So just inverting this immediately tells you all of these can be just plus equals. It doesn't really matter if you've initialized everything to 0, right? So dc is going to be dco times f, dci is going to be dco times i, di is going to be dco times f, c, ci, df is going, to, is going to be dco times c. So I'm just sort of working my way back and computing the derivative for every variable. And then I can keep working my way back from there. So if I go further back, I'm going to get, the next one was ci was tan h of, of zc. But by the time I got there, I have the derivative of the divergence with respect to zc. So again, which rule am I using over here? The chain rule. So I have the derivative with respect to ci. So the derivative with respect to zc is dci times the derivative of the tan h. Then I take a next step back. I have one affine term. I can compute the derivatives for every entry in the affine term, right? And then the previous one was just i equals sigmoid zi. What, will the, what is the rule that I'll be using to compute the derivatives for this one, 16? Yeah. So I would be computing the derivatives for dzi. And what is the rule I'd be using? The chain rule again, right? And so what will the formula be? It's, it's on the slide, right? Because at this point, I have the derivative for i. I'm just going to multiply the derivative of i with the derivative of the sigmoid, right? And then I can keep working my way back all the way down the line. So every single step, what you will observe is that at no point is there any particularly complicated equation over here. This was this huge complex box. All I did was take my steps backwards one line at a time and the model I used was the computational model for the whole thing. How did I compute stuff? And once I used that, going back was really easy. Make sense to everybody, right? And so when I put the whole thing into a backprop equation, this thing looks so hideously complex, it really is not, if you write it out. And so here's, here was the forward prop. You went from zero to the end that each time you went through the layers and you computed an LSTM cell. So you went from the beginning to the end and at each time you went up the column and computed an LSTM cell, right? Going backwards, you're going to start from here and you're going to keep coming down each column doing the exact same process, the inverse of the exact same process you did going forward. And so here's what you do. I'm going to start from t minus 1, work my way backwards to 0, right? And at t minus 1, I start off with the derivative of the divergence with respect to the output of the network at t minus 1. And then go back, and from that I can compute the derivative for the affine term at t minus 1. From these, I can compute just using the same rules that we saw. I can compute the derivatives for the weights there, the uh, and the output of the last hidden layer at that time, and also for the bias for the, affine, for, the, for the output layer. And then all I do is go back, and since I already know how to compute the derivatives, how to take in values and compute for the outgoing variables and compute the derivatives for the incoming variables, I can wind my way down, right? But now, Cheng, Cheng Shang, here's the thing over here. When I'm winding my way down, there's this magic dh t minus 1, 1 l plus dx t l plus 1. Why am I doing that? 
Exactly. I have this thing at each time. This guy is going to two places, right? So when I'm writing the code, when things when I'm winding backward, the derivative that goes into this term is going to be the sum of the two derivatives going out. The only extra piece of work that I did in the code outside was to perform the summation that made sure how the variables branched out. Other than that, the code itself is trivial to write. All right. So this is the last poll, and then I'll fly through. Ten seconds, guys. Okay, I'll move on. The first one is true. You know, you can just compute derivatives by perform the compute the derivatives by just reversing all the operations in reverse order, and it doesn't require computer. You know, complicated arithmetic. The whole thing is really, really simple. That's basically what we saw. Yes. Just assume that you're going to take all of the variables that you will ever need, that you're going to compute derivatives for at every stage, right? Every variable at every time is its own unique value. So every unique value is going to have its own derivative initialized to zero. That way you will never make a mistake, right? When you're going back, you're going to be accumulating just the right things. When you haven't got any contributions, it's going to remain zero. Right? Okay. So there's one small thing. In all of this, we sort of observed that there's this crazy bit where if, if you remember something, if you, if you forget something, there's nothing you're going to be augmenting the memory with at that point. If you're augmenting the memory at some point, you really shouldn't be forgetting something, right? So this relationship, yeah. What if we start a new sentence? Don't we want to flush out the memory? From yeah, you're going to, every, every, every input is going to be flushing out everything that you've got so far, right? So you're going to, if, if you're, if you're uh, keeping parameters, you'd be incrementing the derivatives for the parameters across inputs, as always. But the local variables are fresh for every memory input, right? Yeah. So here's a bit. The, GR, the LSTM was very complicated. It had a lot of computation. Can we begin simplifying it? There have been very, very many models proposed. I'm going to show you just one. This is the GRU. This basically says, combine the input and forget gates. If I'm remembering, if I'm forgetting something, I won't be augmenting my memory at that point, right? So I'm going to have one gate. It's going to go up with a sigma to the output, to, to the augmentation, and a one minus sigma to the forget. So if I'm augmenting something, I'm, I'm forgetting the, you know, one minus that much, right? So there are different ways of doing it, but this kind of makes sense. So you got rid of an extra gate. Very simple. There's another thing you can do. Why do I need two lines out here? That makes no sense. H is just a function derived from C. I could have just passed one line and done the other computation in the next box. Right? So they get rid of this parallel lines, and then you just see there is no nonlinearity over here. That got rid of one, one entire section of complexity. And then the number of equations you actually have to deal with in a GRU is much smaller than an LST. I mean, guess what? You don't lose very much. In fact, you don't lose anything. This works better in some situations. So there are uh, different approaches to simplify the whole model. So this is getting rid of, I'll skip this poll because we're running out of time. But this is getting rid of pointless, a lot of pointless computation. There are your own variants that you could come up with. In fact, 
to this power. Very good. I'll skip the next one. This is taking more time than I thought. <laughs> Where it keeps them away. <laughs> yeah. This was easy, guys. So five seconds more. GR use the simplifications that use the principle that if a pattern triggers forgetting of a pattern, it can also trigger no, it cannot also trigger increment of the memory. That is true, right? They retain do they don't retain separate lines for the memory and the hidden state, which is basically what we just saw. Okay. So typical LSTM architectures, you'd have things like these, you know. If this is an LSTM cell, these these the horizontal lines are actually double lines. If it's a GRU, the horizontal as a line is a single line. You can have any number of uh, uh, boxes in a column and so on. You can even have bidirectional LSTMs. And bidirectionality doesn't really make this any more complex than a regular RNN, right? So long as you can write the code for backpropagating path through an LSTM cell cleanly, I can just plug that into your standard bidirectional training code and everything should work. So. Story so far, recurrent networks are poor at memorization. Memory can explode or vanish depending on the weights and activation. They also suffer from the vanishing gradient problem. LSTMs are, are an alternative formalism where memory is made more directly dependent on the input rather than network parameters and, or, and, or structure through a constant error Caruso. They don't suffer from a vanishing gradient problem, but as you will see, when you're going backwards, because you have a direct memory line, any derivative that you get at the end stays all the way to the past. And you just keep adding things to it because derivatives always add, right? So as you keep adding things to a derivative that does not otherwise diminish, you always run the risk. It's going to blow up with, with continuous increase, and so it can blow up. And you're also going to have this problem in your ResNets. Your backdrop can blow up. You might have encountered this in your homework, right? because you have a continuous line from the beginning to the end. Well, I'm going to do a brief detour. This should have taken 20 minutes. Now it's going to take 12. Modeling language using recurrent networks, so more, more generally language models and embeddings. So here's the standard problem of language modeling. I give you a sequence of words, four score and seven years, and I ask you, what is the next word? And most of you will be able to tell me this is the, the next word is the word ago. Or if I give you A, B, R, A, H, A, M, L, I, N, C, O, L, and ask you what's the next character, you'll guess that the next character is M. Now, how can you actually train a network to do this kind of a job? Now, so the way we will do it, we're going to represent words as one hot vector. So you, you pre-specify a vocabulary of N words in lexical order, and we know exactly what a one hot representation is. So, Regardless of whether you're handling classes in a multi-class network or words in a language, I can just arrange my dictionary of words in, in some sequence, and then every word becomes a one-hot vector, right? And now in order to predict the next word, all I need is some function which takes all the words until the current time and predicts the next word. Now, each of these words is going to be represented using a one-hot representation. The problem with this, suppose I have a vocabulary of 100,000 words. Every one of these things is a 100,000 dimensional vector. But of those 100,000 dimensions, I'm only using one number, which kind of makes no sense, right? So it's a very high dimensional representation, and they're very sparse. So you have a plethora of parameters, and most of them are not, be, not even being activated at any time. But then why do we need one-hot representations? What is the, can anybody tell me what is the benefit of a one-hot representation? Why don't I use other representations to represent words? Yeah? If I take the distance between any two words, then if I've got, if I have a distance between two vectors, 
which is 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and maybe 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, the distance is simply going to be square root of 2. Every two vectors, correct? They're all orthogonal to one another. So this says that you're not making any, making any assumptions about the relationships between words. You're not saying this word is closer to this word. This word is this distance from this word. Because you cannot, it's, it's not fair for you to make that assumption on your own unless you have some strong reason to do so, right? So that's a good thing. But then there's a flip side. This is an incredibly sparse and useless waste of the space. If I have n words, I have an n-dimensional space. And in that n-dimensional space, how many points will I have? I have an n-word vocabulary. Who's number 10? Oh, yes. In an n -word but if I have an n-word vocabulary, how many points in my n-dimensional space am I using? In this case, I have three words. How many points am I using? Three. Right? Every dimension is being invoked only once because that's the only time I get, only for that one word, uh, do I have a invocation of, that, of the dimension corresponding to it. So it's very sparse. But here's the other thing. If I take this point and perturb it by epsilon, does that point have any semantic meaning to it? No, no right? Because only the specific points you're looking at have meaning. You can't say that just because there's some point which is epsilon off, it represents anything useful. It doesn't represent a word. So it's a very poor use of the word. On the other hand, the good thing is it makes no assumption about the relative importance of words. All words are the same length. So vectors are the same length. So it makes no assumptions about the relationships between words. The distance between any two words is the same. So here's what we will do. We will start off with this one hot representation but we realize that this is a kind of wasteful representation. We see the benefits of it. It doesn't make assumptions. We will try to derive a lower dimensional representation that's less wasteful, wasteful, but then do it in a manner where whatever distance relationships are, cap are, are imposed on it actually makes sense according to the data. So we'll try to project it down by multiplying, if it's an n-dimensional vector, if I multiply it by a k cross n matrix, it's going to go down to a k-dimensional vector, correct? And the k-dimensional vector is a lower dimensional vector. And so now every point is being projected on it. And although these n points use a zero volume of the original space, if you think of the density, right? You're going to have n in r raised to n. For any radius r, you're going to have n points in r raised to n volume, right? Here you're going to have n points in r raised to k volume. The volume shrinks. And so the density of points goes up, which means you're doing, making a more effective use of the space. right? And if this projection is properly learned, the distance between projected points will capture semantic relationships between words. That is the hope. So here's what we will do. In all of these cases, I'm going to not use the, when I'm make, predicting the next word, I'm not going to use the raw one hot word vector itself, I'm going to multiply the one hot vector by the projection matrix W. This is the same as pulling the ith row of the matrix, multiplying, right? And now the predictions, once I multiply it, these, these vectors are lower dimensional. I'm going to use these lower dimensional vectors to make the prediction. And now this function f can use far fewer parameters because what comes in is a lower dimensional representation. But then what is this p? The P is just a matrix multiplication. We know a matrix multiplication is just like a one linear, one affine layer in a uh, network, right? So it's just like a straight up layer, right? Except all of these are the same network. It's a shared parameter model over here. And so now I can think of this as a prediction network. The input is taking in many words. So it has many subnets and all of them are identical. So it's a shared parameter network, right? And I can train, I can perform back propagation and train the parameters of this model easily enough. And so if I were predicting words, here's what I would do. If I were using, for example, uh, I can do this in different ways. I can do this with a recurrent model. I can do this with a time delay neural network, which just says to predict any word, I'm going to look at the past 10 words, for instance. 
And if I were using this time delay model, this is what it would look like. Every word that goes in, so uh, if I'm given a sentence, I'm going to be given the first four words and I'm going to be predicting the fifth word. Then I'm going to be taking words two to five and then I'm going to be predicting the sixth word. Except at every single word, I'm going to be first projecting it down using the matrix P and using the down projected vector to make predictions. So in this process, if I actually train this network, in, I would also end up learning the projection matrix P. Now this is complex, but there have been, a more, there, there have been simpler models proposed. One simple model is this guy over here. Uh, here. In this case, it's a simple time delay neural network. So I'm going to give you sentences, and as you go through the sentence, at each point you will be trying to predict the next word in the sentence. So you don't need explicit labels. These labels over here are just the next word because I'm giving you, giving, I'm giving you the entire sentence. And now you can minimize the KL divergence between the predicted word and the target word over the entire sentence and learn P, right? Or instead of trying to always predict the next word, you could do something like this where I give you a bunch of words and I drop out a word in the middle and you try to predict the word in the middle in which case you're using information from the future and the past. Or you could, do, you could, you could take a word and try to predict all the words on either side. So you're given a sentence. For every word in the sentence, you'll use that word to predict the previous three and the next three words and, and aggregate the error over many such samples. There are many different ways of doing this. In every case, eventually you're going to end up learning this projection matrix P. And here's a standard example people show that when you learn this properly, it actually ends up learning very nice representations. So for example, if you look at the projected vectors that you get, uh, this, is, this is from uh, Mikolov's original paper in 13. He shows the vectors between countries and their capitals, right? And you can see that Beijing minus China is approximately the same as Moscow minus Russia. It's approximately the same as Tokyo minus Japan, Ankara minus Turkey. So all of these vectors begin to carry the, the distances between vectors, the, the, the projected words, the embeddings of words, and the vectors between these words begin to carry sense. Uh, similarly, so this is for a bunch of states and their countries and their capitals. Uh, there was another example which, skip this poll. Uh, Take a look at the answers, they're on the, on the slides, okay? Uh, but uh, they show that, for example, king minus queen ends up looking like man minus woman, things like that. In every case, it has to do with the fact that you've learned this projection matrix P, which takes the one hot vector and projects the data vector down to something smaller, right? Remember this projection vector because you're gonna keep using it again and again in, the, uh, in subsequent lectures and in your homeworks. So modeling language over here, if you were trying to model language, these, you'd have a, with a recurrent network, you'd have something of this kind. You have words going in, they're being projected down, and they're being passed into a recurrent network, which could be, for example, a multi-layer LSTM network. And at each point, after seeing a sequence of words, the network is going to try to predict the next word. Right? You can train this so you can train this whole thing using backprop, but now we can also use this to generate language. So what I could do is just give it, say the first three words, choose some sequence of first three words and give it the first three words. And if the model has learned the structure of language properly, it knows what the next word is, a plausible next word is. So it's going to output, after three words, some probability distribution over the words that are that that could happen at the next time, and you would draw a word from this probability distribution. You could feed it back to the network as this was, this was the fourth word, what could the next word be? And then it's going to generate another probability distribution. And you can keep doing this until you have some natural termination point, right? So here's a very nice example that you get from uh, uh, Andre Karpathy's webpage, he trained a network of exactly this kind. It's very simple on all of the Linux source code and then used it to generate text. And here is the text that he generated. 
And I challenge any of you to find any flaws in this and say, say this is obviously not C programs, right? Right down to the comments, it got everything right. That's the, uh, you know, it's not a particularly complicated model. It's really, really simple, right? You could download the code from Kapati's page and you could train it yourself overnight. And you could run it and, you know, static int indicate policy void. It opens parentheses, it knows when to close them. It uh, knows where to open and close curly braces. It knows that if you're using a particular variable within that, within a block, it has to be incremented only within that block, but it doesn't get invoked outside or before. All of this is sort of figured out by this model just by analyzing a bunch of source code. It's pretty impressive, right? Or these guys, I think I'll, I'll stop with this if I can get this to play. Usually I cannot. The They just got a bunch of MIDI files for piano, trained an LSTM for it, and used it to generate stuff. It's perfectly plausible, right? Perfectly plausible. Anyway, so I'll stop right here. All of this is fine, but the one thing that happens here is that when we were doing language prediction, when you're predicting the stock market, we always assumed we knew what the output was going to be. We could define a loss and we could use it to train the network. In many situations, that's not going to be the problem. We'll deal with that in the next class. And guys, if you can, please return your tokens.